<laughs> Welcome to this Ask an Expert session. We're glad you're here. There are quite a few people signing on and more that keep joining us as the time goes on. Thank you for being here and for taking time out of your day. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Tracy Staffis, and I am with the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center. And the center sponsors this Ask an Expert webinar series, which convenes skilled practitioners with registered participants to discuss topics related to human trafficking. You can find past Ask an Expert webinars on the center's website. Uh, as I mentioned, our format today is a panel discussion followed by an open Q&A with you. We'll be discussing how to use local data to better understand trafficking in your community. Following the webinar, the center will email you handouts as well as a full Q&A document with the information discussed today. You'll also receive a link to the full recording that you're welcome to share and watch again at your convenience. Now, I am pleased to turn it over to Elise Altenberg. Elise is with the um, Office for Victims of Crime at the U.S. Department of Justice. She is within the Human Trafficking Division, and she is a Grants Management Specialist. So, Elise, over to you. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's Ask an Expert session. So data can be a valuable tool in better understanding human trafficking in any community. Data can help in identifying potential victims of trafficking, patterns and tactics of perpetrators, and vulnerabilities in industry. Data can also show the effectiveness of an organization's policies, protocols, and partnerships in serving victims of human trafficking. Data can also feel a bit overwhelming. Fortunately, we have three national experts today to offer their insight and answer your questions. Today's discussion will include information on data sources and applications of data. Our panelists will talk about how to identify and use multiple data sources to better understand human trafficking in a specific community. There is a lot of good information to cover in the next hour, so let's go ahead and get started. I would like to introduce our moderator today, Marie Israelite. Marie is a human trafficking expert and currently serves as the Director of Victim Services at the Human Trafficking Institute. Marie brings many years of experience working with government and non-governmental partners on building their capacity for victim-centered, trauma-informed human trafficking investigations in the United States and also abroad. Marie is also a member of the Field Advisory Committee for the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center. Marie, over to you. Thank you so much, Elise. It's great to be with all of you here today and to be a part of this Ask an Expert series. I really look forward to this conversation on human trafficking data. And let's get started. Joining me today are our three expert panelists, Gonzalo Martinez de Vedia, Eliza Riach, and Dr. Jessica Herbert. Gonzalo is a labor trafficking expert and published author. He currently works at Verite, where his work focuses on ethical recruitment in the Americas. Previously, he designed and implemented programming to counter forced and coerced labor in the Texas agricultural sector and he did trafficking related policy work in DC. Welcome Gonzalo, it's nice to see you. Thanks, nice to see you, looking forward to it. Eliza is a child sex trafficking expert, experienced trainer and published author. Eliza was the former director of programs at Shared Hope International and is currently the strategic advisor on child sex trafficking at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Eliza, welcome. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. And finally, Jessica is the CEO of Idea Analytics, a partner to communities, government, and public safety leaders on developing and sustaining programs to support victims of human trafficking and other crimes. She brings decades of experience in criminal justice, private industry, and academia to her work assisting communities with data analysis, technology, partnerships, outreach, and strategic planning. Jessica, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marie. Hello, everyone. Gonzalo, Eliza, and Jessica, we really appreciate all of your time and expertise and look forward to this discussion. For um, all 252 participants um, and others who will hopefully join on this webinar, thank you for being here. We hope this discussion will be informative and helpful as you use your local data to address human trafficking in your communities. As a reminder, don't forget to submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom right of your screen. While participants begin to think of and submit their questions, I'd like to get the conversation started with a few questions of my own. Gonzalo, if you wouldn't mind, let's start off with you for the first question. Data collection and analysis can seem very overwhelming. What three tips would you offer an organization who wants to utilize more data in their organizational decision making? Sure. Yeah, let's jump in. Uh, first of all, it's so great to see uh, pretty friendly names in the chat. From uh, Amarillo to Buffalo, you all know who you are. Nice to see you today. Um, data can be uh, a taboo and overwhelming topic. And what I've found is that um, agencies are either really diving into it with a lot of resources or not using it at all. And a good place to start is just to kind of find that middle ground. The assumption I'm making is that most of you do not have dedicated staff to only focus on that type of work. But with a little bit of effort, a little bit of commitment from someone's time in your team, you can actually um, get a lot of results. So my first tip would be to start with the basics. There are national and uh, regional state level groups that have already put a lot of resources into gathering, cleaning, packaging, and presenting data in ways that are already quite accessible. Uh, and that's everything from confirmed human trafficking prosecutions that have been gathered um, on national data sets to calls to the human trafficking hotline. But beyond trafficking specific information, there are great resources about risk from all the usual um, oversight and regulatory agencies. If you look at 20 years worth of wage and hour enforcement data, OSHA and health and safety data, you can learn a lot about the risk that is already out there within your community that might indicate that there are red flags for human trafficking. Once you have had a chance to take a look at what is available in your community, I would encourage you not to reinvent any wheels before you start to take too much time uh, analyzing that data or uh, finding your own sources. In almost every case, there are people on the other end of these agencies that work on, on this particular kind of information all day, every day, and they are almost always glad to get an email from someone looking to use it, especially for something as important and as anti-trafficking work. So in my experience, uh, it can often be worth our time to pick up the phone and make that call, especially to the state level agencies. They've been the friendliest in my experience about just troubleshooting. And um, if you have a particular data need that you're not quite getting from their public website, they've been known to sometimes just um, send off an Excel sheet that already has exactly what you need. Um, but of course, there, are, there is a limit to that. There are limits to how much these outside agencies are going to be able to do for your individual initiative, task force, or group. And my third bit of advice would be that when you do get to that point that you are going to invest some resources and time into uh, gathering and cleaning your own data or using these outside sources to do something more advanced like geospatial analysis, it doesn't have to be that your whole office becomes um, trained in, in the use, um, analysis and visualization of data. You can often find one or two people in your team that have a particular interest or passion for that type of work and delegate that, that part of the work to them. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be staff. Um, there are interns and fellows coming out of really specialized programs at many universities around the country right now. Um, the last thing I would say about that is if you're looking for that data lead, don't necessarily think inside of your office. There are so many tech, um, like I said, programs at universities or even private companies that have pro bono programs where they will lend technical capacity and even staff in some cases for a good cause like this. So as long as you can articulate what you're looking for, you might find yourself with a, a team to help you out. Um, so that, that's one place to get started. Great, that's so helpful. Thank you for those tips. 
Eliza, uh, Gonzalo mentioned this in his response uh, in terms of national statistics. How do you find that national statistics can be used to better understand a local trafficking perspective or issue? Yeah, thanks, Marie and, and Gonzalo. I think you're right on of that idea of not reinventing the wheel if you can avoid it. National trends can definitely help inform your local data. So to give you some examples of trends that we're seeing at NCMEC, um, first of all, uh, the 17,000 reports of child sex trafficking we received last year were in every community and uh, or in every state and every type of community. So urban communities, rural communities, suburbs. Um, so really helps informing kind of where to start, um, but that we are absolutely seeing trends that can help shape shape how the data may uh, may trend. So for instance, uh, we know that youth who run away or are missing are more likely to be targeted by traffickers. Um, we saw that one in six of the children reported missing to NCMEC that had run away from care were likely victims of trafficking. Um, you know, we're also seeing that I don't think it'll surprise many folks on this call to know that folks in marginalized communities are also more likely to be targeted by perpetrators. Um, we saw that especially Black girls are uh, disproportionately represented as more likely to be trafficked within our reports. And similarly, you know, we also saw that uh, Indigenous populations and uh, Asian communities, Asian Pacific Islanders are underrepresented. So what might that mean as far as reporting as well in, in the data and trust? So thinking through the context on some of that, tr those trends are really important. Um, and similarly, we're seeing an increase of males being identified as likely child sex trafficking victims as we start learning as a community that we should be asking these questions as both to male and female youth or youth of all gender. Um, but I think it's also, as you're looking at those national trends and data resources, to remember what they do and do not represent. So for instance, at NCMEC, our data is only representative of reports that come in through 1-800-THE-LOST or cybertipline.org. So for instance, if I am kicked out of my home because of a domestic violence situation, or I say, you know, mom, dad, I don't care what my birth certificate says, this is my true gender, and they say, get out of my home, that's not necessarily going to show up in NCMEC data. Uh, so we really want to make sure to say that while we can get substantial and important information in those trends, that you need to also be aware of different types of data and how that's being represented, which I know Jessica is going to talk about as well. Um, and something that's really helped us, so for instance, we saw um, our trends continuing to go up. Uh, we've always seen that young people who are in the child welfare system are more likely to be targeted and might be at higher risk for child sex trafficking. Um, but when there was a mandate for child welfare uh, agencies to report children missing to NCMEC, we all of a sudden saw that that data really skewed towards a number that may not be representative of the field because now all of a sudden these kids are mandated to be reported to us. So we saw a 300% increase there. I think it's really important to make sure that again, you're always framing the data. And one of the things that's been really, really helpful at NCMEC to help us think through some of those nuances has been the implementation of uh, our survivor council or survivor expert working group, which are a group of paid consultants that come in and learn about our process and provide feedback to help us shape and inform the data that's coming in. Thank you, Eliza, for all of those uh, thoughts and recommendations. I just had a follow-up question before I move on to a question for Jessica, which is, uh, having to do with sources of data. And you mentioned that in a lot of communities, AAPI communities, native communities, certain immigrant communities, uh, that uh, potential victims are underrepresented in uh, both nationally and locally reported data. Do you have any recommendations of where organizations and advocacy groups could look for better data on underrepresented uh, potential victim communities? I mean, one of the things that we talk about within our data is not having all of your numbers be uh, hinged on a disclosure of human trafficking. So the more that you're looking for potential uh, risk factors along with actual intervention, I, you know, I am not a, a statistician or a sociological 
researcher, so I want to be careful of interpreting the data too much, but I think it's fair to say that in a lot of those um, communities, there is a lack of trust of law enforcement. And so the likelihood that maybe a child would be reported missing um, to law enforcement might be less, for example. So thinking of who are the agencies, organizations, et cetera, that are working with uh, those populations. And again, the more conversations you can have with people with lived expertise, I think is really, really important. Thank you for underscoring that. It's really helpful. Uh, Jessica, I'd like to turn to you now and ask, uh, for you, what is the first step to take to start using human trafficking data to inform the work? Sorry, I'm going to build on a couple of points from our other panelists here. Is, um, in our experience of working with agencies, and we primarily work with small and medium-sized cities, and help them focus on understanding the challenges or problems around human trafficking. For many public safety organizations or even some of the other um, social systems in a community, they um, are uncomfortable with the topic of human trafficking, whether it is in terms of uh, sexual trafficking or labor trafficking. So it could be something that everybody knows occurs, but they're not comfortable with talking about it in policy meetings or other types of um, you know, groups to understand what exactly is going on or, you know, thinking that they can address it through other ways. And so we, um, our first step is to advise our clients to have a data summit or a data strategy session. And that's designed around some of the points that both Eliza and Gonzalo have already said of, you know, what do you know and what do you already know about um, the data that's out there and, and what can you um, extrapolate from that data? And that's often leading to more questions or um, you know, more challenges for folks of really understanding what does human trafficking look like in their community. And that's where the summit can really help um, uh, stakeholders get together and um, discuss some of the both sensitive aspects as well as maybe some of the frustrating aspects of the data and the reporting. So for our data sessions, we have them focus on kind of three key areas to understand some of the elements of human trafficking and what it could look like in their community. The first one being about environmental factors, and that may be based on certain businesses or industries that are in the community or in nearby communities. Um, so if you are, um, as I saw several of the folks from the chat here and um, places where you have large trucking lines or transportation thoroughfares, um, things uh, like Gonzalo's work down in Texas with the um, agricultural businesses and other migrant labor or um, farming uh, transitioning throughout the year. Those are some of the environmental factors or environmental characteristics that you would want to think about. And what do you know about those places or what are the stakeholders that you can engage for both awareness around human trafficking? The other area is the individual area, which obviously um, Eliza mentioned a lot about of just the individual persons that are at risk and how they are or are not reported um, to, you know, whether it's to the police or courts or even to school systems. And so, you know, we're really mindful about how um, youth that are in foster care or are homeless or runaways or otherwise have, um, you know, some uh, you know, less structured environments that they um, can rely upon noticing that they're missing or noticing that they're at risk or um, slowly being recruited into those, um, uh, into human trafficking. And then the third area in the data summit that we um, focus on is um, obviously there's typically a, um, a couple of groups that bring everybody together that are focused on that. I see many of the folks for various cities across the country represented on this call today and um, you may be an, a, a business or a nonprofit, but there's other um, groups that are interacting with um, people either at risk or potentially involved in human trafficking. So thinking outside your immediate box to um, bring in um, other groups from pro-social activities like your boys and girls youth clubs and athletic or school programs, as well as your school districts and uh, school teachers and your faith-based community that may not understand that they are um, seeing people who are uh, impacted by human trafficking or they're seeing elements of human trafficking and they may not recognize those signs. And so from a uh, public safety perspective and some of our clients in the public safety systems is that, you know, a lot of our domestic violence or other victim advocates that sit within the courts or CASA 
uh, groups and things of that nature can also be a good resource to bring together. So um, I will wrap that up with just like some of the key outcomes you should be thinking about your uh, data summit or your data strategy meeting is really about identifying those new sources of information and how you can interpret some of that information or potentially collect it, uh, as well as being able to develop some uh, local but very specific data that uh, is helpful for whether you're working in prevention, intervention, or recovery services so that you have some action items from that. Um, and most importantly, uh, this is often where you get into um, some good discussions about whether uh, folks can share data or not share data and what are some of those parameters around that um, that you may need to work, work through uh, as, a, as a work group and in order to be more informed about your human trafficking. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, now we are going to move to your questions. There are several great questions that are already in the Q&A. Don't forget to submit uh, attendees your, your questions uh, through the Q&A box at the bottom, but um, I will start with a few uh, that I noticed coming through. Um, one individual uh, who's participating today um, uh, talked about the over or the high representation of black girls um, in sex trafficking uh, being highly represented in the data. Are there any insights into how this impacts services and outcomes? And does the data show disparities in system responses to communities of color? Um, either Eliza or Jessica, would you like to take that one? Um, well, I can, since I, I shared the stat to give it a, a little bit more content or the not even stat, but information of the disproportionate representation, um, that data isn't specifically connected to services or service outcome. It is really specific to reports to NCMEC. Uh, so I'd wanna be careful in uh, over uh, evaluating what it means. But what, what I can tell you is that we, were, we compared the amount of African-American black children reported to NCMEC to both US census data representing children and uh, as well as the AFCARS data around the same time period. And I, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers, but I wanna say it went about 15% of the US census uh, data population to closer to 30, 35, but then making up almost 48% of NCMEC data. So really seeing, again, uh, a skew. Um, what I can definitely say as far as uh, the, how that affects services uh, one of the things we're hearing loud and clear from the service provider community as well as the survivor community is you know, the importance of cult cultural competency and representation. So making sure you know that you're seeing people who look like you succeeding and thriving and supporting you on that journey. Um, you know, and similarly knowing that uh, when we're talking about survivors of this kind of shared trauma that you know, that doesn't define who they are. It's part of a holistic response to the needs uh, that they're facing and, and how we can respond. Thank you so much, Eliza. Does anyone else want to chime in? I'll, I'll chime in from the uh, uh, researcher and social scientist perspective. Um, just, you know, understanding um, some parts of our system are inherently going to introduce a bias or a skew of data. And I think that's where I appreciate Eliza's point of, you know, really putting some context around why is there an over or under representation and what that means. Um, and, and not jumping to the conclusion that it is happening more frequently to one group or one gender um, or, or less, less uh, likely to happen. So I think some of that is part of your both understanding of the available data out there, as well as any data that you um, end up collecting individually for your program has to be very mindful of any um, inadvertent or, or you know, even unintentional bias that you're introducing with how you're asking the question, when it, at what point um, individuals are coming into contact um, and, and what system is it coming from knowing that the systems and, and by systems, I mean school, courts, police um, are interacting with different folks in different communities at different rates. And so that can um, lead to the both under and over representation of data sometimes. 
And I think what Jessica is saying is such an important point to keep in mind across really every data set that you look at across every form of trafficking. Take uh, farm workers and labor trafficking, for example. The vast majority of workers are not registered um, or showing up in the, in the systems that you would normally consult. So a very common pitfall that I see is that groups will fixate on the H2A agricultural guest worker program, which is very data rich and really important to look at, but it's only about one eighth of the workforce, right? So if you only looked at what the system was giving you, you would miss out on an underrepresented part of the population. Um, so by, by always looking for that blind spot, you know, you, you, you always um, get yourself to a better place usually by way of understanding what you're working with. Thank you. And to follow on to that, Gonzalo, if, if um, it's only getting you one eighth of the potential population, I noticed in the chat a number of um, individuals and organizations who do work with farm worker communities and focus on labor trafficking. Um, do you have any specific suggestions on where else they can look um, for labor trafficking data, particularly in the agricultural sector? Yeah, no one data source is going to do it all for all parts of, of, of your community, but the best you can do is layer and layer and layer different sources and you sort of begin to triangulate information and get the bigger picture. So for agriculture in particular, like I said, you would look at wage and hour enforcement, mm -hmm. um, safety enforcement, and then your state level regulatory agencies usually have a lot of people out there in the field generating enormous data sets um, about where the populations are. Health, um, migrant health and migrant education agencies have incredible national outreach programs that have learned how to find hidden populations and um, building those partnerships and getting information from them can be very productive when it comes to that, that topic, yeah. Thank you, that's so helpful. And I forgot to note, uh, we have probably about 25 minutes remaining for uh, to take your questions. Uh, with our expert panelists and the questions are continuing to come in. I did notice that there were uh, a few questions that were related specifically to native communities. Um, one uh, related to how to use data to better support indigenous communities and another that ties in the typical historical uh, distrust that native communities have of law enforcement, which in turn affects reporting um, and can exacerbate experience of trauma and historical trauma. And any suggestions you can tie in for engaging indigenous communities in reporting um, when there are such significant trust issues. So it goes a bit beyond the scope of data, but it's all related. Um, I can take a stab at that question. A bit. Thanks, Martha. Um, and I think for me, it is coming from a very honest place of, um, I feel like sometimes to be able to, able to say I'm an expert and ask an expert, it's because I have made so many mistakes that I needed to learn from. And um, I feel like so often when it comes to human trafficking or really any vulner vulnerable population of people, um, that you're building the plane as you fly it. And to assume that you know is, is always a bad place to start. Um, so, so again, um, I've, I'm reinforcing the point that as opposed to uh, necessarily stepping into a well-established uh, indigenous communities, networks, coalition, tribal coalitions, et cetera, um, I think I think starting there of asking how do how should we start? You know, we are the we are the new kids on the block. And similarly, you know, again uh, at NICMIC to I'll continue because I think it is one of our my favorite projects. Two of our consultants um, are of Native American descent and have talked a lot about the fact that we need to be inviting tribes in to learn about what we can do to build that trust and think through what reporting would start to look like. So I'm excited to learn the answer with all of you, but I would say those are the steps we're beginning to take. Oh, thank you. Jessica. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, uh, Eliza, uh, I think oftentimes in um, my work with the indigenous tribe and um, their leadership in variety of, of social services is um, we often try to impress like our system and our way of doing things on them. 
and that doesn't work. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I think that's where in, inviting them in. And I know I saw, um, for those of you that are on the line here from Yakima, I was out that way last week. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's where just those relationships and conversations of what could this look like and what they're comfortable with and, um, you know, and what are those capacities? And I think those are all things that are, you know, if it's not that first data summit or session, it's those continued conversations to, um, you know, get everybody on board um, with what is the intent and purpose of this, um, you know, to help or prevent or intervene with these things. So I think that's an excellent step. And Jessica, you reminded me too, I just, one great resource on that in particular, it's a little dated, um, but if anybody's familiar with the Shattered Hearts Report, one of the th one of the things in the narrative there that I thought was so helpful, it was specific again to child sex trafficking, but was, ta was talking about exactly that, was making sure the researcher who led that um, does have a PhD uh, in sociology and research, but also is of the Seneca tribe and was able to really build up uh, trust in that community and shape that. Sorry, Gonzalo, I didn't mean to jump in front of Gonzalo. No, not at all. That, that's um, really, there, there's, there's not much more to add to what you all said other than thinking about the data part of that in particular. A part of what's built into that question is sort of a reminder that, yes, some, some communities are not going to show up on federal databases in the same way that others do. So I, I would just go back to the same point that we made a little earlier. Do not put all your eggs in one source, right? Just um, uh, use different layers that are going to give you more of that, um, more of that local perspective. Like I said, community level data sources sometimes can be just as useful as these fancy national um, dashboards. Um, it does take a little extra work to get to know folks. I remember out in Western New York, uh, we had a great collaboration with one task force in one particular community out there that I won't just put on the spot and name, but they would bring seven people to the team. And there were people within that team who um, had more access to information about the school systems and local policing. And uh, that did give us a little bit of insight and orientation in that case. So not all data has to come from high above in, in DC. Thank you. And I think that's a good segue into my next question or an attendee's next question, um, which relates to systems. Uh, does any, do any of our expert panelists have recommendations on specific tools or systems for interagency data collection and sharing that can be used by uh, multiple agencies and organizations, both public and nonprofit? Jessica, maybe I would start with you. Yeah, I'm gonna have you repeat the question again. Is it about sharing system sharing systems or collecting it's, it's about uh collecting to report collected agency data and share with interagency partners that was my understanding okay yeah so um <laughs> so if it is about the collection from multiple stakeholders i think there, um and this just commonly becomes a barrier is um most of this data is hitting on various protected parts of information. So um, on the West Coast here and in California, the protection of juvenile information is, um, you know, layers and layers of how that information is shared and how and what it what does it mean when it's shared. Um, and so that does create some challenges when you're working with juveniles or trying to prevent juveniles being recruited in or intervening. Um, it often means that individuals have to go to juvenile court, and this is not just specific for California, so I don't want to totally isolate the state there, but um, many courts provide, uh, require you to go to juvenile court to request that information and to go through human research uh, board processes or institutional research board processes to uh, collect that data and protect that data. Um, there are times where uh, different systems in the, you know, single community. So the school board to share with the courts, to share with foster care, to share with police. And that typically requires a memorandum of understanding or some other kind of data sharing agreement that is agreed upon by everybody's uh, legal or general counsel for those institutions. So um, it's oftentimes where some data from the school board could be shared, but keep in mind that FERPA which is the um, federal protections for uh, um, 
student data, both at uh, public school and uh, college level, protects that information about student performance and student, um, you know, other kind of student behaviors or activities. And so being able to understand what can be shared and not be shared and where are the, um, where the national rules are and then where's the comfort level of those uh, social systems and institutions. And that's um, one of the biggest barriers and, and sometimes it's easily overcome, but it is one of the biggest things that is, is discussed when starting with different projects or other evaluations is just understanding how will people share that information and, and to what extent. So happy to talk about it more if you wanna contact me offline on some of those legalities and processes for both the court as well as general counsel. Now that Jessica did all the hard work of thinking about all the important sort of guardrails that you have to put on that work, maybe I'll, I'll give the easier answer, which is what is, uh, what is technically possible out there? And the answer is there are tons of tools that are probably better than they've ever been because of the technology, right? So that includes, for example, um, when it comes to geo, geospatial analysis, so you know, getting information about addresses that your field team is visiting, um, ArcGIS Online, Esri in particular, has these um, really easy to use out of the box tools that people can use on their phones. So they can report their locations of different interactions. And if you're working within the privacy of one agency, you know, usually that, that's the best setting um, to do that safely without you know, risking any type of data breach. But in that case, you can gather lots of detailed information about where you are interacting with people, where things are popping up on the map, and then there are ways to store them for relatively low cost. Last thing I'll say about that is if you are a nonprofit organization, always double check with these companies if, if they don't have a pro bono or low cost option for you, because they often do, and um, it tends to be way, way less expensive than their, um, their usual licenses. So um, that's... Uh, that's one way to um, save on that. Thank you. Um, I think it would be great to have a brief discussion among the panelists. There are several questions in here that relate to uh, reliability of widely known, widely shared statistics, whether those are national figures related to prevalence prevalence or international, or uh, the number of trafficking victims who are able to be freed from the trafficking situation, for example. Um, can you talk at all about the limits of the re reliability of the statistics that we have um, and how to um, use and interpret uh, those data points that you might see in particular in the media. And then I have a follow on to that. Maybe Jessica, we'll start with you. Well, that's a loaded question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think from any data set, um, and, and I think, you know, we probably mentioned this a few times at this point, is that you, it's not just knowing where it came from. Um, you know, to say that, you know, crime statistics comes from the FBI and we feel like that should be a pretty um, reliable source and it's, you know, established since 1953 and we've been doing it every year since. Um, I can tell you that uh, social scientists and criminologists constantly critique those things, right, is that how it's, it's still not enough, right, but it's the best thing we have. Um, so I think when we look at all these uh, data sets that are produced and how that information, I think Eliza, I won't steal your thunder here, of how that information's coming in, knowing that it's highly reliant upon someone making a phone call to um, you know, an 800 number or filling out a form or collation of those things. I think it's, it's a due diligence from everyone to just understand a little bit more about those data sources or um, ask the, the organization about how that source of information is collected and, um, particularly when you're talking about uh, secondary and third reporting, um, you know, that they're building on and or using multiple things, just knowing that that methodology for that data changes across the time. And so um, really being able to kind of use that with a, a disclaimer, however big or large, you know, big or small of how you interpret that moving forward. So, yeah. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I. Um... It's 
funny. I say this at work all the time, actually, is that I I firmly believe that 46% of all human trafficking statistics are made up. That I mean, kidding, but truly there, um, if you, uh, I think many of us, especially uh, that are working with research, know that there have been um, misquoted or requoted out of context that have, that will just never uh, seem to go away, Nick Mick included, where, where we've had situations where a statement was taken out of context in a congressional testimony, which then was cited and cited and cited again and again um, to, you know, that we're still trying to course correct that misinformation. Um, so, uh, or similarly, I know um, a statement about a research, of what, what is it, the one in three children will be lured into child sex trafficking within so many hours. Like that was actually listed in some big forms, but when they actually went back and tried to find where that data came from, I believe the organization had said, actually, we don't use that data anymore because of the research was faulty, but it's it's still all over. Um, so I think that the more you can connect to the source anytime you recite data, but then secondly, um, also making sure that like Jessica was saying, thinking of what this does and does not represent. And I would, because I saw it come in too about some of the viral stories as well. I'll take this as an aside plug to say, um, also just be considerate of the information that you're sharing and how. Um, I don't think we need a conspiracy theory to prove that child sex trafficking is happening and needs to be addressed in our communities. And so, you know, when we get 3,000 reports to cyber tip line in one weekend about something that's pretty... Uh, <clears throat> aggrandized, that means that our, our analysts are taking away from those cases that are happening right there in their community. Thank you. That was a good self segue into the next question, which was about misinformation and how to use data to combat misinformation, uh, which is so common throughout, uh, throughout trafficking, but in particular uh, with regards to minors and and sex trafficking. So thank you for, for mentioning those points. Gonzalo, did you have anything else to add there? No, sometimes what can be useful is just to, rather than um, chase down every, every old stat that is being repeated, it's just to introduce better, more recent information into the conversation. And I'm always optimistic that that'll sort of start to take up more of the space in the conversation out there. Um, and in some cases that does mean as service providers, as law enforcement, regulatory agencies, it does mean taking that extra work of deciding how can we share a little bit about our data without running into any privacy issues, right? So yes, it takes extra work to anonymize data and to aggregate data and to put it out in a safe way, but you are doing a public service in many cases by giving that local news channel something better than just something they found on a, on a government website. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just adding something to everyone's to-do list now is to think about how to publish your data. But, uh, but it, it really is um, useful to, to help each other out with that perspective. I'm going to use this opportunity to let folks know that all questions will be answered in the Q&A document. Uh, so you will, uh, even if there are questions we don't get to live, you'll be able to see uh, responses in the Q&A document. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a question from an attendee asking, does our organization, uh, does your organization offer APIs, application programming interface, and are there any reliable human trafficking related APIs that you would recommend? I just learned what an API is, so I'm probably not going to jump in on this one. Thanks. Jessica, we're looking at you. I know, uh, <laughs> and I was I was fast thinking. Uh, you know, Gonzalo might also have a, a couple of points here of, of what that looks like. Um, uh, so, for the person who asked, I I don't believe that um, the the one eight hundred human trafficking and, and the data that's um, pushed out that way um, that they allow that data to be downloaded in any way. I mean, their maps are stagnant and their reports are um, also stagnant. So, I don't know that that will um, support your kind of interest for APIs in order to um, process for a different application or um, track that. I will say that, um, uh, you know, a variety of different research has been done with um, other 
um, kind of API access data points, so thinking about um, comments or um, other sentiment analysis in that way to kind of report on human trafficking. So I don't want to divert too much, but if that's something of interest, by all means, please feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to point you in the direction of that research and some of the things that I think both Stanford and Arizona State University have done to kind of identify human trafficking that way. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, was, relates to the use of data for program information. And Gonzalo, maybe I can turn to you for this one. What types of data uh, should uh, organizations be documenting for their human trafficking programs? That'll really vary agency to agency. Um, my first job related to trafficking was uh, involved entering my time in, in 15 minute increments into TIMS which is a system that I think many OVC grantees got to the point. I understand it now, it's, uh, it's come to the end of its days. So uh, I wonder uh, you know, what's next there and, and uh, what that'll look like for people. I know that for many agencies, that's the start and the end of what they do by way of data collection, right? Um, because it's sort of an internal case management system. Um, that being said, you know, there are tools beyond that for almost every need. Every level of privacy need versus collaboration and open source um, uh, goal, right? So for the agencies that are maybe not working with personally identifiable information, but are rather doing more of a risk mapping exercise and wanting to talk about broader trends, um, like I said before, we're probably in the golden age of not only tools to build that with, but channels through which to advertise that and I would even add in at a time that a lot of people are working from home and spending more time at uh, at their computers you probably have more of an audience than you ever did you know I think when, when many agencies go back out to the field that'll become less of a priority so the time is, is uh, the timing is great right now to um, to use the tools um, that are out there I think, yeah, I can't really give an answer without knowing more about specific needs. So I won't start listing off every possible tool there, but if anyone would like to follow up specifically with a um, type of agency and a goal that they have, happy to brainstorm. Yeah, I, I could add um, just having the direct service provision experience, again, more of a plug, um, to researchers and their consideration um, that that while I, I think the whole reason we're having this call and the evaluation is incredibly important with data, um, it's also really important to recognize that uh, for those of us who have done direct services or are doing it, there are, are often inundated with data requests. So making sure that you're also thinking as you're working with those organizations and agencies, um, how is that mutually beneficial? Like if, and are you, even some at NICMIC, I think some of the things we've realized is we're often getting requests of one more thing to ask at standard as far as our hotline. And at the end of the day, like we need to get a child safely recovered. So while we want to be collecting that data, it can't take priority. And similarly, like if a child's disclosing being abused or an adult or anybody, you want that data to be disclosed to somebody who's going to be able to provide services long term. So just you know, again, it's a little outside the scope of the question, but worth considering as you're as you're doing reinforcing the point that both Gonzalo and Jessica made of being sure you're building those partnerships in advance. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's a good tie-in to the next question um, that an attendee asked related to using data to actually make programmatic. Um, and relationship improvements. And the question was, um, how can you encourage organizations to publish data that may not paint your efforts or programs in the best light? For example, sometimes anti-trafficking programs or interventions fail, or they uh, don't quite uh, meet the benchmarks that were set for them. And a lot of times, um, it can be difficult when organizations are concerned about future funding uh, and, and don't want that information to become widely known or public, but it could be really useful data uh, to learn from. Jessica, you look like you, you want to jump in there. I was just having this conversation earlier with a fellow researcher about how, um, you know, it's just di difficult to have good data and, and like good data or research methods, even though everybody's trying. And, and I, I had commented to, to him earlier that 
you know, this is particularly true with nonprofits is that, you know, you want to be able to show success. You're, it's tied to your ability to kind of get funding or um, kind of champion for fundraising and why people should continue to support you. Um, but that, you know, some of the measures or the intentions of measures are, are often mismatched. Um, and I think that's where it, it's really important for folks to think about, you know, and or work with a researcher about what is the correct logic model for you, right, um, and your program. So if it's about prevention, how will you actually measure prevention? Um, and <clears throat> if it's about intervention, uh, that potentially could be a little bit of an easier uh, measure, but it, it's th there's still some challenges with you know, what are those measures that are truly indicating that you've intervened and or help that person sustain, um, you know, fr from, from human trafficking or, or other types of um, risks. So I think that's where, you know, sometimes it's a, a balance of what's the fundraising and the business model um, and the business effort. And then, um, you know, kind of the, the realities of the logic model, which is, what are the true outcomes that we're capable of measuring and can we develop those enough to have a quality improvement plan for our programs that still gets us funding, that still shows that we're making an effort and we're supporting um, survivor services and things of that nature. Um, but I think that's, that is definitely a diligence on behalf of each program to think that way. Thank you. There's a question that came in that I think relates to kind of uh, law enforcement uses of data, and I'm hoping uh, one or two panelists might be willing to answer. And the question is, um, has there been any interest in anticipatory analyses in the sense of the identification of the composition, direction, or potential exposure uh, to known or suspected trafficking routes or threats within global migration patterns or crises? to attempt to inform or operationalize foreign policies or border inter interception? It's a very big question that may take longer than the two minutes we have remaining, but does anyone want to give it a shot? <laughs> That'll probably be our last question to answer live. Sure. Depending on, on the particular migration flow we are discussing or, or the, the catchment area, there are some great international programs that have invested. You know what I said earlier on the call, on the, on the webinar, um, that I expect most of you wouldn't have dedicated data people. The fact of the matter is there are some agencies, especially international agencies that have nonprofits and governmental groups that have created, um, in some cases, you know, 25 person data teams that um, work on this all day, every day, and then gather information from the field and put it out on interactive dashboards. I just spoke with a group called Mixed Migration Center, for example, that has a little bit of what you described there. Uh, but I am aware as a non-law enforcement person that's had a chance to study criminology and to work with law enforcement, that there are two worlds of data that are available out there. And one of them sometimes is behind uh, the walls of, of government and law enforcement, and they, they work with information that would never leave that circuit. And um, what, what I was reminded about in, in some of what I studied is that there is an entire field of crime mapping and, and, um, and crime data analysis that, that people are trained in, that they uh, make professions within. And usually it, you know, it tends to be a broader mission than just looking at human trafficking, but finding those individuals, even I'm remembering New York State, New York State Police had a crime, crime um, analysis people that would come to task force meetings, getting to know those contacts and thinking about what they do from nine to five and how it links to just your specific need with human trafficking, that can be very, um, very productive. I'll just bring it back to that point I made in the beginning. We don't have to reinvent every wheel within the anti-trafficking space. Some of these approaches have been studied, created, tested, compared against each other. And now there are full-fledged professionals in some agencies working on, on uh, uh, developing these tools. So all, sometimes all we have to do is be able to articulate what we need as anti-trafficking professionals, and we might get a lot back. Thank you, Gonzalo. I think that brings us uh, pretty well back full circle to where we began this great discussion. I'm sorry we weren't able to address all of the questions live. Um, it was a really engaged group. Um, thank you so much. I will turn it uh, back to the facilitators.
This concludes the live Q&A portion. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, Eliza, Jessica, Gonzalo. We are so thankful for you sharing your expertise with us today and being here for the session. We will be following up with everyone in, here today, as well as those who registered and were not able to make it through email, attaching relevant resources, uh, an FAQ document with questions um, and handouts. We would also love for you to take just a minute to answer the closing poll, which includes some topics that we'd love to get your feedback on for future Ask an Expert series. Um, we'll also drop a link in the chat um, for you to sign up for OBC News. Uh, that's where you, you can get the latest updates from the Office for Victims of Crime. And then we'll also be sharing out a link to the Understanding Human Trafficking Training Series, which um, provides a lot of foundational information on how to build a, a plan and a strategy in your local community. We hope you found today's session informative and we look forward to having you join future Ask an Expert webinars. Thank you everyone for being here to today. Take care. <laughs>